And we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're in verse 7. We'll read verses 7 through 10 out loud together, but we're picking up on the second part of what I started last week, and the title of the message is Avoiding Evil, and this is a very creative second message. The title of today's message is Avoiding Evil, part two. All right, so let's, uh, let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 7 through 10, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Growing is something that God has in store for each of us, and I think that sometimes um, we have this concept in our Christian life that we will have a marker in our life where we say we have finally grown. And if you have those types of events, of events in your life, you will still have circumstances in your life where you will recognize your own failures and wonder, have I really grown? And I know it's something that little children pay attention to. By the way, every intern that we've ever had, we put up against our wall at our house and we put a marker for them. You guys remember when we had Brandon Teske, 6'7", so he's up there. Then we had John Schaff, 4'3". No, he wasn't 4'3", but um, anyway, so uh, we all pay attention to growth and we should. And uh, even, even the older you get, you still pay attention to growth. Am I to this or am I to that? And, and you spiritually want to be growing, but God wants you to be growing. And here this morning, we're in this passage looking at verse 7 and hopefully we'll walk all the way through it. I am going to pick up where I left off last Sunday. But in verse 7, now I pray to God, the prayer that he has for the Corinthians is that they would do no evil. That we should, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. We'll take care of the whole latter part of that passage as we move forward today. But we were in the first part of the message, and I did not give you all the passages that I thought would be accommodating and encouraging and building upon this theme of avoiding evil. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. This is the passage that we left off with, and then we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That you do know evil is the prayer. Evil is that which is against God, but it has another definition as well, and that is that which does harm. That which is harmful, not only to your own life, but the life of others, to the life of others as well. And it is God's desire that you and I avoid evil in our life. And it's something that we actually should hear, take heed to, and know that just because people say they are worshiping God doesn't really mean that they are if they ignore what the scriptures teach and how we approach this life and live this life. Now, why does that matter? Because a lot of Christianity today is just another version of what I would call some kind of a religious hedonism. It is a, a huge emphasis of liberty in the Christian life today. It is a huge void in preaching that you would even talk about evil. It is a huge void that you would talk about sin. A matter of fact, yesterday at um, the Zwicker's funeral for Carol's sister, Joan, I had one of the family members say this to me, and that is, after the service, she came to me and she said, uh, I want to thank you for the message that you preached during the uh, funeral. She said, I, I go to a Baptist church, and, or I think it was a Baptist church, and she said um, she's been to a lot of churches, and it's been a long time since she's heard the gospel. And I just, you know, I don't, I don't think that every message that we preach is specifically about the gospel, but every message we preach is, is because of the gospel and because of the Lord. And I just think it's a shame that in our world that sin, hell, righteousness, holiness are really absent in the preaching that people are doing in what they call church. And I think you should know this, that as a visitor here today, we're not saying that we're the ones that are getting it right. We're not saying that we're the only ones either. We're simply saying that our heart's desire 
is to follow the teaching of God's Word. And, and for the people that are gathered here today, that's what we unite around, the Word of God. Now, in that, though, there is this desire that God has in the believer's life that you and I avoid evil. And you're going to have a hard time avoiding evil if you're just enjo- indulging in what the world is offering to you. So in Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11, you're there. Let's read that out loud together as well. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that she may approve things that are excellent, that she may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. This, again, is said in just the same way the 2 Corinthians 13, 7 is. This is my prayer. This is the prayer for God's people. In 2 Corinthians, to the Corinthian people, and Philippians, to the people at Philippi, the church at Philippi, this is the prayer, that you would abound more and more in knowledge and judgment. And this is, by the way, I think the wisdom of God. <clears throat> Man, in his application uh, of Scripture, we can get it wrong in every which way. Even when we're trying to do right, we can get it wrong. Sometimes we can emphasize standards over what the Word of God says. And yet, God has called you to live a standard of holiness in your life. I think it's interesting that in many of the standards, God doesn't tell you exactly everything to know. Have you ever noticed? Now, I know this is, this is so touchy, but have you ever noticed that God doesn't tell you exactly what style of music to listen to? Have you, have you noticed that? Okay. Have you ever noticed that, he, matter of fact, in modesty, when you talk about modesty, God doesn't give you exactly lines and measurements on what modesty is. And I believe it's the wisdom of God to do this. Why? Because every culture has to approach the Word of God with this sentiment of heart at hand. I want to honor God with my life no matter what the world is doing. And it's right for Christians to react against whatever the world is doing. Now, let's, let me, I always use this silly illustration. It's a little bit silly, but it's not. Uh, Are musical people or musical groups in the world trying to be an influence on the world? Are they? Well, all you got to do is listen to what they say, and they absolutely are putting themselves forward to influence people. In a way, they are preachers. They are telling people what's right and what's wrong. And very often, those who are... Uh, in that world are telling people things that aren't sound, go- sound doctrine and things that aren't true. And I often use this illustration, you know, um, let's pretend there was a musical group that wore a white button-up shirt with long sleeves and, and the right sleeve was a red sleeve and the rest of it was a white shirt. You got the picture? White shirt, one sleeve is red, the right sleeve is red. And this group's message <clears throat> is that God is unholy, that God is evil himself, or that evil is good and that immorality is good. Uh, Christians hearing that and seeing that message would naturally react against that message, right? So that means then that many Christians then, if they were to see the white shirt and the red sleeve, would immediately associate that message with that group. Fair? Fair? But is a white shirt with a red sleeve evil? No. But Christians, because we love God, don't want to associate with that which is against God. And therefore, societally, we make decisions based on what we see. And we continue need the discernment of God to do so because culture continues to manifest itself in different ways. And you and I have to chew on it and discern What is that? And should I do that? And is that what God would have for my life? And that's the standard, not that we all necessarily approach everything exactly the same way. Uh, Or I should say, land at the same conclusion. But the goal is to have godly discernment that we live in a world that reflects who God is. Now, this has never been more apparent than in basic life. So much so now that you have commentaries and commentators and people writing books on what is a woman or what is a man. Is that, what, what is it? Is that the, is that the name of the book? What, what is it? Is it what is a woman or is it what is a man? Somebody tell me. 
What is a woman? See, I, don't, I know what, what a woman is. I'm just saying. I, but there's a book. There's a book about it if you need it. But I, I would just commend instead of the book, just how about read your Bible? How's that? But that's the way it is. And, and the world is all the time getting this wrong. But you're the one as a, a steward of the truths of God that needs God's judgment and discernment. And it isn't just going through life doing what you want to do. It isn't just going through life doing what I want to do. It is surrendering to God and evaluating all things by the standard of who he is. And that's really what love is. That's really what love does. Love pays attention. Love seeks to do that which is right. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> do you need to pay attention to everything? In the Christian life, do we pay attention to everything? Hello? Well, this is a, this is the standard of, word, of the Word of God. First Corinthians 10, 31, Colossians 3, 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Whether therefore you eat or drink whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever we do, we do with the Lord in mind. How many of you have pets in this place? I'm sorry for your financial contribution that you have to make, but um, I can't remember the statistic, uh, but I think it's pretty close to this. People say that if, if people have pets going through life, they will spend approximately $40,000 uh, taking care of that animal. Um, yay, there it is. Uh, but do we pay attention to the animals that we care about? Yes, we do. Sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. Well, what do you mean? Well, the sprinklers were on. The cat was in my lap. And it's been a long time since that cat's had a bath. I won't say what happened, but you know. <laughs> uh, every day, every day in this heat, uh, there are frozen bottles of water, uh, gallon jugs, and frozen two liter bottles that go outside to where the rabbit lives to make sure that the rabbit is happy. How far have we gone in our love for this blessed creature? We even have solar-powered fans to condition this lovely creature's life. Now, why is that? Why is there a paying attention? Why is there a paying attention? Because somebody in that house... Loves that rabbit. <laughs> but somebody does. So why do you pay attention? Why do you pay attention to your animals? Because you actually care about them. And you pay attention to what they need. Now, does the Lord need anything from us? Does the Lord need anything from us? But what does the Lord want from us? One word. It's the name of this church. Fellowship. That's what he wants. So are you paying attention to your life? Are you paying attention to how you live it? First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 23, would you read this out loud with me? The theme is, now I pray to God that you do no evil. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 23, reading out loud with me. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, so this is the word of God. This isn't Jeff Estes making anything up. It's just me sharing with you these passages that have in reference what does it mean to live the Christian life. And by the way, that's a whole other series that we could do. Uh, I think, uh, Kevin, where are you at? Kevin, uh, your series on Tuesday night is The Christian Experience. Have I got the right title right? And that is basically what does life look like for a believer walking through this world? Well, in part, 
here's, you could take all your Bible, but we're looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, and this is what God has for us. And I just want to give you this. In the midst of that, you could break down each one of them. They're all worthy. Every one of these verses are worthy for us to sit on. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Everything give thanks. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Uh, in the midst of that is the idea of not being resistant to the message of God. That I would not be resistant to the word of God declared to me. Now, I want you to know this in Idaho. Now, I, I find this is true. I think people are people wherever you go. I, I know that in the West, we like to believe that we are independent and that we wear that as a badge. But I have found that people are independent everywhere you go. There's another word for independent. Thank you. I didn't say it, you said it. Some, some of you said it, and it is stubborn. Um, and that's true. I remember the first time I was preaching in a church in Idaho, uh, I did not know how to take it because as I was preaching, this is how people sat through the whole service. <laughs> and then I realized, hey, that's just culture of Idaho because after the message, those same people came and say, hey, appreciate the word of God. Thanks for sharing the word of God. I'm like, well, you sure looked like a Baptist while I was preaching it, you know? So, uh, <laughs> um, but the word of God should be welcomed and received. Going further though, it says, this statement, what's, what's the very first phrase in verse 21? Say it out loud. Let's try it again. Verse 21, 1 Thessalonians 5, what's it say? So, it is the idea of testing all things. Now, by the way, this is not a hypersensitivity to rule breaking. That is not what this is. Christians, I believe, have the wrong focus and the wrong view of God, if you're walking through life as if, oh, I might mess up and God's got a bat behind his back where he's waiting to hit me with the bat because I stepped out of line. That is exactly the wrong emphasis and wrong culture of the Bible. The culture of the Bible is that God loves you, God's for you, and God wants to walk in fellowship with you, and God is going to only lead you to that which is good. But you and I have to test all things. Everything put before us is not good. And just because the world is selling it doesn't mean that you need to buy it. Now it goes further and it says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Now here's how far it goes. Verse 22, what's the first phrase? It's one, two, three, four, five, six words. What's the first phrase in Proverbs 22, everybody, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, everybody out loud together, abstain. So, does God care about what's being put into your life? So much so that he says even to abstain from the appearance of evil. Now again, the wrong focus brings you to the wrong conclusion. In this room right now, there is this view going on. Well, I'm not sure that I want to surrender to God because if I surrender to God, he's going to take some good thing out of my life. And I'm just telling you, if you believe that, you believe the wrong thing about God. Now, it is true that you may like things that aren't good for you, but God is not going to withhold that which is good for you from you because God is in the process of sanctifying your life. That is what he's doing. And by the way, if you know Jesus, you, can I say this as a friend? You might as well make the decision right here in this room this day that you're going to surrender to being sanctified because that is what God's target is in your life. And you're either going to fight him or surrender. And you might as well make the decision now because it is the blessed life that surrenders. But you need to pay attention now. How much do you need to pay attention? I, I walked around this building the other day. And frankly, we pay to have landscaping done, and there's a lot of people that pay attention, and thank God for everybody that's involved in what everybody's doing. But do you know what? That weeds will grow, out, grow up without your permission anyway. Amen. And as I walked, I was driving out, and I looked over here at one of these planters where we have several plants growing, and it's just the way it is. I found a plant this tall, 
that was growing up in the middle of all of that and actually wasn't in the middle of it. It was actually in between things and so healthy it looked like it had been planted there on purpose and that we were nurturing it. <laughs> and then as, as you know, anybody, anybody else care about getting the weeds out? Yeah? Well, what happens when you start paying attention? Yeah, it's not just one. They are everywhere. And what happens if you don't pay attention? That's what it all becomes. So in your life, there are weeds of evil that need to be pulled out. And in my life, there are weeds of evil that need to be pulled out. And praise God for yesterday's success in how you walked with the Lord. And I hope you have been successfully walking in fellowship with God. And successfully means that you're not perfect, but you're paying attention to your fellowship with Him. You're trying to do the right thing, trying to avoid evil. But yesterday's success is great, but not good enough for today. And you and I cannot ever rest on the vigilance of our spiritual welfare. While you live in this world, you will be dealing with evil. And frankly, you need the Lord. Abstain from all appearance of evil. This isn't just abstaining from evil, but abstaining from the appearance of it. And then you have following that, and the very God of what? Everybody say it out loud, the very God of? Do you realize that's what it is? That when you surrender to the Lord, that's what you get? Everybody who ever repents over some issue in their life that they've been stubborn about and resisting God about will have the same testimony. They finally came to a place of peace when they surrendered. Every person. And every person resisting that sanctifying work in your life lives in a perpetual state of unnecessary conflict. But it really comes down to your view of God. Do you believe, I'm really hoping to get an answer out of this, do you believe that God is good? Yes. Do you believe he's trustworthy with your life? Yes. Do you believe he's for you? Yes. So naturally follows, why would we not surrender? And I think all of us have a little phrase maybe kicking around in our head, there's really not any good reason to offer except for the belief that I really want this thing and this thing that I think is going to... Anybody ever read of the sin of Achan? What did Achan... What was Achan, Achan to have? Do you remember? What did he want? He wanted gold. And he had it for a very short time. But when he had it, what did he have to do with it? He had to hide it. Because he knew it was wrong. And that's exactly what's going on in your life and my life. Folks, you know how you're doing the wrong thing? If when somebody walks in the room and you're on your phone and you have to turn it off so that people don't see it. Or you have to flip your screen away so nobody sees what you're seeing. Or you have to put on some kind of an air to look like you're not doing what you're doing. And it's all this silly game of hide and seek when God already knows. And God is not waiting with a big bat to hit you. God is wanting you to be in fellowship with him. He's wanting his best for your life. But it comes from being surrendered to him. The very God of peace sanctify you, and the, I think it's interesting that the next word that follows that is holy. Holy being in every way and in every part, and the fruit of which the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think there's probably anybody in this room that says, you know, if God wanted to, he couldn't blame me for something because we're all sinners. 
It's only in the righteousness of Christ that any of us can be declared to be righteous and blameless. But in our disposition of life, our living of life, this should be our target, to love and seek Him. Romans 12, there's a few verses in Romans 12 I want to share with you. Some of them you know so well, you can quote them. Um, but I'm really targeting another verse, verse 9 later on. I'm going to start with Romans 12, 1 and 2. But I'm going to look at verse 9 as well. Now, we... Nathan Ellison preached on this. I think probably Pastor Phil has. I preached on this. It's one of my favorite passages. How many of you have ever memorized Romans 12, 1 and 2? Any of you? Yeah. It's one of those, it's one of those passages that many Christians know very well. Romans 12, 1 and 2, if you read that out loud together with me. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's something about reading that verse, I believe, as you read it and the Holy Spirit works within you, there's something about reading that verse that just says amen. Yeah? That's, that's what it seems to me. Now, I, I will tell you, there's not every time in my life when I'm in the flesh and my flesh is, 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 is like showing its head, my heart wouldn't be crying this passage. But this is the nature of what the Holy Spirit does. And here in this place of worship, when we read these verses, the believer's heart says, yes, this is right. This is good. But in this, he does give us some things to consider And it's in this last part that I want to focus of verse 2, the idea of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is the changing of your mind to agree with God based on the authority of His Word. That's really what renewing your mind is. That you may be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and here it is, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we try to avoid that which is evil, we have to make decisions on what is acceptable in my life, no matter what everybody else is doing around me. So, the easiest illustration to make with this is you and I all know what it is like to be a taste tester. Matter of fact, I have found that people are not just taste testers when it comes to food. They are smell testers. And I will tell you that there are foods that to the young person's heart and life just do not pass the test. They just don't. So I can't explain this, but all my growing up years, my parents would make for New Year's, and I don't know, I think maybe it's an Irish thing, Uh, maybe it's a Catholic thing because that's how my dad grew up. Um, but every New Year's, they would have, and I, I, this is a bit of a cultural test to see if anybody else had this experience. So, know you, how, you know how you have turkey for Thanksgiving, at least many of you? Maybe Christmas you have ham, maybe you have turkey again because you're redundant. Um, but for New Year's, my family mixed it up. And what they made every New Year's was corned beef and cabbage. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? I'm sorry for you too. <clears throat> now, it's a mature thing to walk in the house and smell cabbage cooking and go, yum. <laughs> you know, broccoli's in the same world. Hey, amen. Come on. You got to be honest sometime. And you know broccoli needs help when you got to cover it in cheese and everything else. You know. You know it needs help. But it's got to pass the nose, it's got to pass the taste test, and and we're all pretty sensitive to it. If something doesn't pass the taste test, we don't do it. We don't do it. Uh, Matter of fact, one of the things of the young people going on a missions trip is they get to experience, they get to, you heard me say it right, they get to experience new foods, right? So uh, the New Zealand team, you guys know what I'm talking about, you guys ate fish a lot, right? And uh, Heather was telling me, I don't know what this is called, 
uh, but they said they served something on uh, with the fish. It looked like an organ. It looked like an organ. It wasn't an organ, but it looked like an organ. And what it was, was the sack that contains the fish eggs. And you're supposed to say yum at this point. You're supposed to like that. And I, how many of you New Zealanders tried it? Did you try it? No. I got one here. No? Al Settler, you know something about this. You and I, well, you tried it. I didn't. I just put you up to it one time. That's a fun story. I'll tell you another time. Um, but the point is, all of us know whether we want to receive something or not. Another, te- another test, liver. Some of you right now are thinking liver. Yes, amen. Others of you have standards. <laughs> so here's what, here's what we do. We're all testing. We're all testing silly things like food because we want to make the decision whether we receive it or not. All I'm saying is that this is how it is all through your life with everything. And it really is everything. And by the way, I'm not a real fan of this. I get it. I get it. There are, pl- there are places not doing good things. I'll give you one, Disney. It ought to appall you what Disney's doing. But Disney not alone. Christ is not the, at the center of that company. Did you think it was? So expect the world to do what the world does. And that doesn't mean we have to hate anybody. But I'm going to tell you this. A lot of times Christians get sociopolitical. And what we start doing is saying we're going to boycott this place and boycott that place. and boy. Now, I'm, I'm not saying you should never do that. But here's what I am for. You make your own decision not based on what everybody else is doing. That is not the standard. The call of the day is not that I put on Facebook, everybody boycott Disney. The call and standard of God is you walk with Jesus, let God guide you. And there is freedom in that. And there's joy in that because you're living a life that follows God and not some man's standard. Everybody in this world needs Jesus. And Christians, just make sure we don't have the attitude that we're better than other people. Right? Right. Romans 12, 9. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Can we amen to that? By the way, you might ask why I ask our people to say amen to it. It is a part of your worship. It's a part of your saying, yes, this is true for my life. Yes, let it be so. Amen to this. I want this to be true in my life. I want this to be applicationally true in my life. As I worship to God, the amen is the surrender to yes, this is so. Now, again, it's really important to me, folks, that you understand that Jeff Estes is not trying to get you to do anything that Jeff Estes wants. I'm just trying to give us all the Word of God and that we all examine what is being allowed in our lives, what we're dealing with on a daily basis. And it's not just today. It's for the things that are going to come up tomorrow. So the mentality that God gives is that we abhor that which is evil. We cleave to that which is good. And we seek those things which are good. And we make them a part of our life. So, let me ask you something else. Do you pay attention to how you're doing physically? Do you? Does it matter to you? So, when I went to Montana and started feeling this this whatever it was... um, I, I have a strategy on how I try to manage weight and try to make progress. In my life, I try not to eat as much as possible, and you know that doesn't really work well, but that's what I try very often. So in the mornings, very often I will drink coffee, and, and this is true. I mean, you can ask my wife, this is, this is what I, a normal life for me, is I will eat one meal a day, 
And you guys are thinking, boy, that must be some meal. Um, but I try to eat one meal a day. So I'll drink coffee in the morning, and then I'll, it's very often 3 30, 4 o'clock where I'll, I'll eat, and that will be the meal that I will do. But we know when things aren't working, you start opening yourself to other ideas like vitamins <laughs> and drinking water. Now, I don't know water doesn't, I don't know why water doesn't count when it's in coffee, but it doesn't. It's just proof that there's a sin curse in the world. But then I also, my son-in-law and daughter are nurses, and while I'm there, they're like, Dad, you need to eat, and they start throwing these protein shakes. Now, I want to tell you this. Here's this protein shake. First of all, it's this big, and Dakota gets this huge scoop of chocolate something, plops it in there, and then he goes and he gets peanut butter and plops that in there. And then he puts bananas and plops that in there and says, drink it. And I think, man, there goes a diet plan. That's enough for a week right there. I mean, you, you got probably 680 million calories right there in that cup. I don't know. But you know what? You're willing to do whatever it takes to start feeling better because you know what you're doing is not working, Right? You search because it's not working. Some of us in this room, really all of us, are broken spiritually, and we feel like God is distant. We feel like we're just hollow, and you really need to take some time to evaluate where you are with the Lord so that you can be healthy. Prove what is good. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now we're going to actually move on to the last part of 2 Corinthians 13 verse 7. So I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 13 7 again. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we appear as reprobates. No matter what you think of us, Paul is saying, we want you to do right yourself. Not for our own approval, but that ye should do that which is honest. That is our hope and prayer for you. Why? Because it is the good will of God. And he says, though we be as reprobates, if you look at us as those who are rejected, so let's put it in this context. Sometimes people look at a preacher and by the fact that you're a preacher, they already want to say that, well, you're a hypocrite or you're this or you're whatever evil thing they want to say. And Paul is saying, fine, think of me however you want to think of me. Though we be as repro reprobates, rejected, artificial, not genuine, not the real deal. Even if this is what you think of us, this is what we pray for you and wish for you. And it matters. It matters to the work of God. It matters to the church of God. It matters to ministry. It matters to what happens in being a light and being salt and being a testimony in this world it matters that you, everybody eyeballs, please, right here. It matters that you do right and live for God. It matters. Your life matters. Your testimony, your living for Jesus in this world matters. Now, the glorious nature of the gospel is that not only does living for God become a light and testimony for others, but that is really not the reason you do it. You do what you do because you love Him. Verse 8, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Always stand on the side of truth. It is who the Lord is. I think what we'll do is save this verse 8 for next week, because I don't want to burst past this because there are passages worth sitting on as we, examining, as we examine living a life that stands on the truth. But believer, I want to encourage you. God is for you because He loves you, and His will is good. His will is good. And as we worship Him this morning, I just hope we would take the admonition in our lives, to abhor that which is evil and to cleave that which is good. 
and shred away what everybody else thinks, what all the other Christians are doing, and you just come and surrender to the God who loves you and let him be who he is, that is, King and Lord of all. And the King and Lord of all, again, who loves you.